Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks so much for being with us here today. And when I say here with us, I mean in this digital space. Right now, I see we have people connecting in from all over the United States, from Kuwait, from the Philippines, from areas all around the world. And as you watch this, you're probably sitting in front of a computer or a tablet or a phone. And the way that you experience this learning and connect with us today is shaped by so much of the technology that we're using to be together. As we think about our young people who've not only grown up in this digital space, but many have expanded their use of technology in the past couple of years. They've learned in virtual classrooms, they've used social media as a social activity, and they've consumed so many news stories about what's happening in the world all around them right now. So how does this digital space and this digital world affect the way that they're developing their social and emotional skills? How does it affect their well-being and the way that they see their roles in our society? If you've joined us before, you know that CASEL's Building Connections webinar series is about making connections between social and emotional learning and the priorities in your communities. Today, we'll be exploring that connection between SEL and young people's digital lives. So now I'd like to welcome our presenters, Daniel and Isha. Daniel Vargas is an education content specialist at Common Sense Education, where he develops research-backed educational resources that support young people to thrive in a digitally interconnected world. And Isha Bush is the Director of Education Programs and Development at Common Sense, where she leads the Digital Citizenship Program. She develops research-backed curricula to ensure the digital well-being of all students with dedicated efforts to promote a positive learning culture around media and technology within schools. Welcome, Daniel and Isha. Thank you. So nice to be here. Um, just wanted to kick us off by getting to know our audience. And so we had mentioned using Mentimeter at the very beginning, so just wanted to kick things off by using Mentimeter and really just want to understand what grade band of students you support would be helpful for us to be able to understand and potentially tailor some of our examples uh, based on understanding the audience. And so I think the link is in the chat. And if you just enter the code, you should be able to answer this question. Daniel's going to be refreshing his screen to be able to see the results as they populate. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, Isha. I am super, 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 duper excited to to be with you. I think this is the first time we actually get to present together. I know, <laughs> and I we it. get to, to to really share something um, that I'm really, really proud of, and that is the, the work that we've been doing around uh, digital citizenship and social emotional learning. Okay. And thank you, the audience, for like waking up. For those of you who might be in, in, on the West Coast, for waking up so early and and being here with us. Um, we are based in San Francisco and just overall excited um, uh, to, to see, to be with you here, you all in, in community. So thank you for filling this up. I see there's, it's amazing. Luis. I see that there's lots of uh, middle school um, and high school educators. That's, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and for those of you who, who are selecting other, I'm actually, this, there's a lot of you. So I'm actually curious. Um, if you could share what what role you you have on 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 the chat yeah i think some schools just structure differently so maybe a different grade band or broader grade band um, yeah we have levels. lots of people counselors uh, <laughs> that's awesome really thank helpful you. to see this thank you um so as we're continuing to kind of monitor we'll definitely keep track of where this nets out. Um, I just wanted to kind of get us started with what we have in store for today. And so for today's agenda, what we're thinking about doing is first really understanding the research on the role and impact of technology on young people's lives. I think as Justina kind of explained and introed us, there is no doubt that the past 18 months have taken a serious toll on young people's lives. And we really wanna be able to kind of put that in perspective with the research. Um, we're then going to talk really deeply about how we can support students through digital citizenship and social emotional learning. What is the connection between the two and how does that come to life? And then take a deeper dive on what we mean by that by showing a 
developmental skills progression of what are young people dealing with at different ages and stages throughout their schooling, what are the types of technology needs they have and the social emotional needs, and then see pictures of practice. What does that look like from a pedagogical standpoint and how we can actually support young people through learning resources. Um, we will definitely take time for questions at the end, but feel free to populate the chat with questions as they come about so that we can um, address them at the end. And just kind of kicking us off, what, what is common sense education and what do we do? We are a national nonprofit that does a variety of things, but really focusing, we have a consumer side where we rate and review all ed tech tools and media for kids. Uh, we have an advocacy side where we are advocating for the well-being of young kids. And on the education side, which is what we're focusing on today, we empower teachers and students to harness the power of technology for learning in life. We do that through ed tech ratings um, to make sure that we are elevating the practice of educators that provides meaningful experiences for young people. And we also do that through a free K through 12 digital citizenship curriculum. So we're gonna be talking and focusing a lot on that curriculum and pedagogies around that today um, and the connections it has to SEL. Before we get to that, I wanna turn it over to Daniel. I mentioned that Common Sense has a lot of uh, research that we conduct and that really does inform the work that we do. So I'm gonna turn it over to Daniel to help kind of take us through a little bit of that. Thank you, Isha. Um, so as Isha was mentioning, before we dive into what digital citizenship is and how it is connected to SEL, we wanted to start by giving you the context of why digital citizenship is so important right now. Now, the first data point that I want us to consider actually comes from that time before there was a global pandemic. So this little story time. On March 13, 2020, which is the same day COVID-19 was declared a national emergency in the United States, our research team was wrapping up the last set of interviews for a study to better understand media use among students ages zero to eight. Now that study complemented a report we released a few months prior and that addressed the same issue, but for students in ages nine to 19. On both studies, our teams found that screen time, particularly non-school related screen time, was on the rise across all age groups. Those numbers that you're seeing on your screen right now are the average amount of time that young people were spending in front of screens doing things like watching TV, playing video games, re reading for pleasure, and connecting with friends. One important thing that I wanted to note, and that's the little box on the right, is that when we disaggregate the data by socioeconomic status and race, our team also observed differences in how students used and accessed screen media. Young people in low-income homes spent almost two more hours using screen media than their peers in higher income homes, and Black and Latinx youth were more likely to access screen media through mobile devices when compared to white peers. And I will dive a little bit into what this difference means in a couple of slides. As you could see in this slide, all the screen time that is, is students were already being exposed to before the pandemic came with its own sets of challenges. Now, I wanted to start by sharing these pre-pandemic insights for two reasons. One is that as the disruptions caused by the pandemic continue to drag on, and as we collectively experience the social pressure to return to normal, it is important to not lose sight of what normal actually looked like before COVID-19. We do not want to go back to a time when 40% of children experienced cyberbullying or witness online hate speech, or a time when only 40% of middle school students had reliable access to devices that allowed them to complete schoolwork. In short, really what I'm trying to emphasize here is that there is no going back to normal without addressing the challenges of digital life. The second point that I wanted to make with this data is that 
I wanted to just really highlight how technology before the pandemic and before we went into remote schooling and remote socialization, technology was already playing a central role in students' lives. Now, this is important to keep in mind as we consider how young people in the context of the pandemic have adapted their use of technology to cope with the different challenges that the pandemic has exacerbated. Now to really hone in on the why of digital citizenship and how digital citizenship connects to social and emotional well-being, I want to now turn to the current challenges and opportunities that the pandemic has brought about. One of the primary areas of concern that parents have expressed in light of the pandemic is the issue of screen time. What you're seeing on your screen right now is some data from the Pew Research Center. In a study earlier, earlier this year, they found that most parents say their children are spending more time in front of screens. And as you could see by the headlines on the right, this increase on screen time amongst young people has definitely raised some alarms. This is important. This is an important challenge to well-being that we need to keep in mind, but it also is not the full picture. There is an equity component that I want us to consider alongside this. Now, a couple of slides ago, I shared how before the pandemic, Black and Latinx students were more likely to access screen media through mobile devices. The reason for this is that Black and Latinx students were less likely to have a computer at home. Now, most of you have dealt with this in, in the midst of the pandemic. You know, this unequal access to computers at home really exacerbated what we came to understand as the homework gap or students' uh, inability to have access to that technology that's necessary for completing schoolwork. This has been one of the bigger challenges uh, that, of the pandemic. And a lot of districts have put lots of effort in bridging those gaps. This, uh, these efforts in turn have had some real positive effects like allowing low income students to participate in schools and even allow their parents to become more involved in their day-to-day -day educational journey. You know, in the middle of the pandemic, we were seeing reports of specifically black and Latino parents being very grateful for the ability to really hear about what their students were learning in the classrooms. Now, I bring up both this challenge and opportunity of screen time because it really illustrates something that we call a digital dilemma or a situation about digital life that has no clear right or wrong answer. The dilemma of screen time in the pandemic is that at the same time that we're spending more time in front of screens and at the same time that that could have a negative impact on our well-being, increasing access to devices that are driving screen time up can also have a positive and equity oriented impact. This also highlights the importance of including parents in how we approach digital citizenship. As we're really thinking through like what our relationship is to technology, whether or not we have access, it's really important for us to really understand um, how digital citizenship impacts us or how, you know, like, um, what we could do about media or like to promote media and technology, uh, like the appropriate use of media and technology in, in our lives. And so to this point, um, we wanted to engage you on, on, on a question and to engage you on a reflection of what your own experience with media and technology um, has been over the past 18 months. So if you could ba go back to the Menti and let us know, how do you feel about your relationship with technology over the past 18 months? Then we will see what things come up. We're hoping to kind of engage you in the practice of, you know, self-awareness, one of the, <laughs> the FEL competencies, just in order to understand for our own selves as adults, how have we been feeling? And we are limiting you, I know, to like just writing a word, which is hard, but appreciate the reflection. And as I you see it I, is a variety of feelings. <laughs> I love I love this word cloud, especially when they come in life, because you know, is the first thing that I that I was frustrated 
and then it kind of shifted right to, to connect it and now there's a lot of you know like this idea has always been constant um what do you notice isha yeah i'm i'm seeing like exhausted overwhelmed you know I'm, I'm definitely seeing like the i'm just looking at what's rising obviously um, yeah. addicted too much anxious draining also seeing the positives <laughs> easy helpful you know appreciative helpful but addictive um so i think you know as we can see it is i mean it is safe to say there are a variety of emotions it's important i think for us to acknowledge that there are really great pieces of it and there are benefits and there are things that are making us feel good and then there's also a lot of challenges associated with it and potentially stress and feelings that we you know really need to kind of address and think through and the purpose of of asking this question for us is to really be able to translate this into thinking about what the impacts could be for students and for young people right so if we as adults potentially have some of those more deeper competencies around social emotional learning to be able to identify our feelings manage our feelings and yes it's a kind of lifelong process to be able to do that let's just put ourselves in the feet and position of young people and what they must be feeling and how they are dealing with these and so i'm going to turn it back to daniel i think just to kind of contextualize that a little bit more yeah so so like that, that's a perfect segue <laughs> thank you for for setting me up like that um so yeah to, to get us to think about you know what um the experiences of our students might look like you know i want to touch on some of the positive and negative experiences um that we've collected uh, on our research and because we are focusing on social and emotional well-being um i thought that the best place to to kind of like get started was to really think through um the mental health challenges that our students our, our youngest um the youngest um community members are experiencing. And so before the pandemic, you know, we were hearing about rising depression rates amongst young people. And the pandemic has made this an even more acute issue. As you can see on your screen, 13% more teens report experiencing moderate or severe depression in the context of the pandemic. This is kind of like a, a, a pandemic development. At the same, same time, we know that depression is a more prominent issue for LGBTQ plus youth, and that because Black and Latinx families have been more likely to be directly impacted by COVID-19, students from these communities are also more likely to report feeling depressed. So mental health is definitely a challenge. And to meet that challenge, um, there are some opportunities and the opportunity of this time this you know time of remote connection is that technology can have a very use can be or work as a very useful tool for addressing young people's mental health earlier this year a research team released a study of the ways young people were using tech to promote their well-being and we found the following interesting trends the first is that a greater proportion of teens is more likely to turn to mobile and web-based applications to meet their mental health needs. The top of which include staying safe from COVID-19 and managing the symptoms of depression and anxiety. The second trend that, 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 that I thought would be interesting to share with you all today is that um, of the health-seeking behaviors that young people most cited, as being helpful in relation to their use of technology. Going on social media platforms was actually one of the highest ones. So young people were citing going to social media as something that they also did for their mental health. Now, as you can see on your screen, 53% of teens say that social media has been very important for staying connected to family and friends. And about 43% of them say social media actually makes them feel better when they're depressed, stressed, or anxious. Now, it is also important to know that for 17% of them, it actually makes them feel worse. I bring this issue of social media up 
because it is indicative of like just the diversity of interactions and spaces that young people are exposed to when they use technology. And these different spaces come with their unique sets of challenges. In the context of social media, one of the challenges that, that, that we saw or one of the trends that really alarmed our team was this rise of online hate speech. As you see on the bar chart, between 2018 and 2020, we saw an increase of young people reporting that they encounter content on social media that is racist, sexist, or homophobic. Now, I share this data and this research with you to emphasize how when we talk about digital life, we are talking not simply about individual issues like screen time or social media use, but rather a whole host of issues that are complex and context specific. And this really sets the stage for why digital citizenship is so important at this time. The goal of digital citizenship is to equip young people to address this diverse array of challenges and to help us understand what actually looks like. I will now turn it over to Isha, who will walk us through the specifics of digital citizenship and how then it, it, it connects to social and emotional learning. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. Very, very helpful context. Um, I'm just super excited to share with you kind of what this connection is. Just thinking about what it means to be a digital citizen, which is a word I think or term we've been talking about a lot ever since the beginning of the hour. Um, but the way in which we define it at Common Sense is someone who is able to think critically about the opportunities and challenges of the digital world and use technology responsibly to learn, create, and participate. And I really want to highlight the fact that we acknowledge both the opportunities and the challenges. I think it's easy to get caught up in the challenges realm. And a lot of the research and thinking through screen time is off the charts. Young people are not feeling well social emotionally, I think is to just say that it's really important for us to continue to prioritize their social emotional well being. That is that is really, I think, the high level piece there. And we absolutely need to acknowledge all of the amazing opportunities. And so with digital citizenship, the idea is not please limit your screen time, screens are bad. It's how do you use it in ways that are productive that make you feel good? And maybe you mm -hmm. do a little bit less of the things that don't make you feel good. But part of it is understanding that. What are my feelings? How do I feel when I'm using it? How can I manage those feelings? If I am communicating with so many people online all the time, how do I make sure those relationships are positive and effective and that I'm dealing with empathy, I'm speaking with civility? It's really a, a, a runs the gamut and we are here to really be able to help promote positive, effective use of technology. Um, the way in which we really think that happens uh, is through really emphasizing five core dispositions. And so we really want to emphasize the idea of slowing down and self-reflecting, being able to explore perspectives with curiosity and empathy, uh, seeking facts and evaluating evidence. So really questioning and being curious, but not a cynical user of, of media, but really being curious, um, envisioning all the options that one has and their impacts. Um, and ultimately the hope is to be able to take action uh, and responsibility. And the way in which we that comes to life and the connection to social emotional learning is through, you know, I'm not sure, I guess, if we've talked about the five core castle competencies, but coming together with thinking about what does it mean to be self aware, which is really about identifying one's emotions, the self management element of being able to, again, manage those stress management, self discipline, um, the social awareness of being able to take perspectives, having approaching it with empathy and appreciating a diversity of opinions, um, relationship skills, and then responsible decision-making. And so this chart is simply to kind of show where the linkages are between the SEL competencies and our five core dispositions that we think through a digital citizenship. Um, and the idea is that at various points, there are certain emphasis or emphases that we kind of have within those dispositions. So just thinking about, you know, Social emotional learning is a core underpinning of digital citizenship and what it means to use technology in positive, effective ways. What we'd love to hear about right now are what are some of those 
social emotional challenges you feel like your students are dealing with or experiencing as it relates to their technology use. Um, and so if you could get back into that lovely Mentimeter world, and I don't, I think, Daniel, do we have the code for the Yes, yes, I, I think Castle sent it on. on oh, on awesome, the lovely. Um, so yeah, if you can just share, would love to kind of understand and get a, get a sense of what are the types of things you all feel like your students are dealing with and experiencing. That's a big one, knowing when to put it down. Okay. Cyberbullying, another big one. Lack of access, addiction, distraction. <laughs> Self-control, addiction, isolation, lack of internet, bullying. Developing appropriate connections. Let me see if I could scroll. Um, I think that there's, it's, it's interesting. There's a, a, a large theme uh, about media balance. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm glad uh, we, we're definitely going to be touching on that once we move on to the um, yes. our pedagogical strategies. FOMO, <laughs> another big one, or not being in the now, that's, that's that's important now, especially as more socialization has moved to, to those digital spaces. Mm -hmm. Just trying to sort through misinformation and mm -hmm. they're getting confused. Really, really helpful to see these reflections. And also, if you can just keep in mind the types of responses you had here, because at the end, we're going to do another deeper reflection that pulls in um, kind of the responses you've had here. So just keep thinking about those challenges that your students may be dealing with. Um, really helpful to see this. And so in thinking through these challenges, thank you for reflecting here. Um, wanted to just kind of share a few examples of how this does come to life. And you've mentioned a lot of these in your responses, mm -hmm. um, but thinking about, you know, from a self-awareness perspective, um, reflecting on how social media impacts one's identity or understanding when you have that, what we call like a red flag feeling when using technology, being able to recognize what that is or what is it like, how, how does your body react? How do you react? What do you do? What is your response? Um, when it comes to self-management, a lot of you mentioned things around addiction or screen time, not knowing when to put it down, that, it, that really falls within the self-management category um, and being able to manage one's emotions around media. For little kids, that's like, you know, we, we, we think about it as like, how do you like say goodbye to, you know, your TV when like there's one more show and you keep, you know, little kids are just constantly asking. I know I have a three-year-old who now gets to watch Paw Patrol and that's a constant battle. Um, and then as they grow older and, you know, they do, they do have their own devices, their own phones, you know, the there's way more independence, but with that mm -hmm. there, you know, there, we need to be equipping them with the ways in which they can have that, that awareness to be able to put it down in self-management to be like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to take a break right now because I need one. Um, when, when we think about responsible decision-making, you know, being able to use technology in responsible ways, what are the positive and negative impacts of being online um, and making the right choices um, with relationships, Tech is all about communicating social media, all about, you know, how are we connecting with our friends and our family? Um, Cyberbullying was a big thing that was brought up um, in the responses that you all had. And so thinking about, you know, how are we being upstanders? How are we being kind mm -hmm. online? How are we supporting those who are experiencing it? And how do we maintain those positive, healthy relationships? Um, and then with, from a social awareness perspective, you know, it's really thinking about how can we value and seek the, you know, perspectives of other people, um, showing concern for others and being mm -hmm. able to really, you know, have a kind of sense of the broader, broader good um, for the world. And so these are just a few examples of ways that digital citizenship and social emotional learning are coming together. Mm -hmm. um, and we do this through at Common Sense, we have, and I'd mentioned earlier, a free K through 12 digital citizenship curriculum. Um, that offers free lesson plans for educators, 
uh, student activities, there are student facing videos. Um, resources are also available in Spanish, um, customizable Google Slides. So it kind of comes with a full suite of kind of lesson materials. Um, and we also really value the whole community approach, which we'll mention a little bit later, but just really thinking about how are we engaging not only students in the classroom, educators through professional development, but also sharing those resources and what's learned in school with families back at home to really bridge that gap. And I will say that I feel like the one, you know, one of the positives that has come out over the last 18 months is that parents and family members and caregivers have really taken a driving seat in the learning of their children. And, and the, I think family engagement couldn't be, you know, more higher than it was over the past 18 months. I think there's like, that's here to stay. And we really want to be able to continue to promote the homeschool connection to being able to like support students in home and school and everywhere they are in between. And so the common sense digital citizenship curriculum brings this to life through six different topics. Um, and again, thinking about your responses, just think about where these might fit in, but media balance and well-being is one of, the, one of them, privacy and security. So really thinking about how to make sure young people are safe online, digital footprint and identity. Mm -hmm. So really imagining and examining what does it mean to, what are one's values, identity? How are they portraying themselves online? How is that different than they are in real life? Um, relationships and communication, cyberbullying, digital drama and hate speech, and then news and media literacy. So I remember some of you were responding about the misinformation piece, and that's really where we kind of focus on that. Yeah, and yeah. I just wanted to really quickly acknowledge yeah. like one of the, the the members of the chat that like put this perfectly like the purpose of us sharing like this background and this like the structure of a curriculum is really to highlight how SEL issues are also digital citizenship issues and so and, and to really highlight that it is possible for us to think about SEL through the lens of digital citizenship and vice versa. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. I think that's that's I think the biggest piece that we hope we can highlight with this is that a lot of you, I think, are SEL educators in many ways, or I'm going to take the take the guess that that is the case, um, and that you are pri prioritizing SEL in some capacity. Our hope is that we're we're able to kind of shed light on how important digital life and the digital context is when thinking about social emotional learning for our young people. It's not the only component by any means, but it's a really mm -hmm. important and critical component that we need to acknowledge given how central it is to not only our lives as adults, but our young, our young people's lives. Um, and so in thinking about how we do this and how this comes to life, we kind of define this in ways of calling it promising pedagogies. And I want to share this in so much as I think it, it really does expand beyond the digital citizenship curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, the curriculum was developed in partnership with Harvard's Graduate School of uh, Education. And so these are, you know, Project Zero, and these are research-backed pedagogical approaches that really can transcend the world of you teaching a particular lesson of digital citizenship and into your other core subject areas. But the idea is that we should address the top concerns that young people are dealing with. Like we should get to know what it means for them to be experiencing, you know, cyberbullying. What does it mean for how are they communicating with each other? How are they using technology? What apps are they using? Knowing that helps us be able to be relevant and engaging to them in the classroom. We should also acknowledge the complexity that it brings. So Daniel mentioned digital life dilemmas in the beginning, and we'll talk a little bit more about those, but there's a lot of these, the way in which the curriculum comes to life is by presenting scenario-based kind of activities or what we call digital life dilemmas that don't have a clear right or wrong. There's a lot that's out there, you know, is hate speech free speech is a potential, you know, dilemma that we have that one can argue either way. And the, the idea is not to get to what is the right answer. The idea is to get to how can I explore other perspectives? How can I learn more and seek facts and evidence? How can I communicate with civility in the process? And those are the types of skills and dispositions we want to be promoting for young people. And so kind of going back to that, that third one, which is incorporating dispositions, a, an approach that we use is something called a thinking routine, which is really a, a very kind of 
structured flow mm -hmm. of thinking that enables these processes and dispositions to come to life. Um, and kind of, and we do that with the coupling a thinking routine with um, a digital life dilemma. And so that's how it kind of comes to life through the curriculum. Another really important piece and kind of bringing this to the idea of, you know, the social emotional learning competencies that we think about are understanding one's role and identity and where that where they then fit within the broader community and world at large. And so addressing digital life as part of a larger system that starts with the individual and is connected to a wider circle of their friends, their community, and then people they may not know, um, which is what how we're interacting online all the time. Um, that is really central to, to how we've framed the curriculum. And so promoting social emotional learning and digital life, Daniel, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Yeah. And so I just, just to like briefly summarize the amazing um, um, information that you shared with us is, is to really highlight that when we think about promoting SEL in digital life, what we mean by that really is um, addressing those SEL and digital citizenship skills and disposition. It means employing these promising pedagogies that kind of acknowledge both um, the challenges that students are facing, but also the student agency and, and their own involvement in, in promoting their own well-being. And the la last and third piece is really emphasizing this whole community approach where we are talking about digital citizenship, not just with our students, but amongst ourselves as professionals and even with our, the rest of our community, like whether it's administration and even our parents and family members. Now, to give you a clearer picture of what this actually means and looks like in practice, we wanted to give you a brief overview of what the different, like what different approaches to addressing specific SEL challenges looks like, looks like across different age, age grades. Um, and I wanted to start with elementary. So just to give you a little context about elementary, um, elementary school students are at a stage where they are learning to use technology for school and to socialize with friends. Uh, and some of the key SEL issues that we might see related to technology at this uh, age, age in, in this age group is you know, identifying how to use te how technology makes them feel. A lot of you mentioned this next one, which is really learning how to transition between on and offline activities and understanding responsibilities when using technology and even practicing um, how, how to be kind when you are using um, your, your device. Now, how do we go about, or how do we go about integrating those promising pedagogies and how we talk about this with our students? What you're seeing in, uh, in, in the screen is one of our activities. Um, and so this, you could access this, but what I really wanted to emphasize is um, the approach that, that you can take in, in, in your own practice when you're trying to, to address these issues with your students. So there's this activity that, that we have around saying goodbye to technology. And this is an activity that's all about helping our youngest learn how to transition between those online and offline activities or between uh, entertainment and like schoolwork when they're using that same device. And so one way we do that is through scenarios. And so we have these sets of scenarios where we put um, students in a situation where they might have to experience this sort of transition. The second thing that we do is emphasize, as Isha mentioned, this idea of a routine or thinking structure, like a strategy to help them manage those emotions. And the strategy that we use with our youngest is this routine that we call pause, breathe, finish up. So as students are considering and putting themselves in these scenarios, you know, we're also asking them to practice this routine of taking a pause, taking a, a, a break, breathing, really analyzing how they're feeling, and then using that to help them transition between, between activities. So this is just kind of like an example of, of what our approach or, or this approach to addressing SEL and digital citizenship looks like in elementary. I also wanted to highlight kind of like the, the family engagement component, which is so essential. And so, you know, if you are an educator and you, you know, you're teaching this lesson or, some, or you're doing something similar in your classroom, you know, there's also room for you to, to, to bring that home as well. And one way we do that is 
we, we have this kind of worksheet or, or conversation started that, that, that we encourage educators to send home with, with, with their little ones. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so looking at middle school, you know, this is where, you know, kids are usually getting onto social media. Hopefully it's not much earlier than that, but legally at the age of 13, they can. Um, and that really changes the dynamics of how they're using technology and interacting with each other. So identifying their emotions and experiences that they experience when they're joining, learning how to manage their use of technology and consumption, um, and identifying strategies for dealing with digital drama. Um, and the, the potential for, you know, upscaling to things like cyberbullying. And so an example of this, you know, is, is thinking about what we I mentioned earlier, but scenario based activities. And so here is an example of a scenario in which there are, you know, students dealing with digital drama. And the idea is they're, they're taking perspectives of one or like one of the peoples within the scenario, thinking about I acted this way because one thing I could have done differently, something that might have stopped me from doing this differently was X, Y, or Z. Like what was the barrier that didn't allow me to do that, you know, in the way that I maybe otherwise had envisioned. All of this is kind of focused around social awareness um, and really being able to act with empathy and understand how you could have either made the right decision or potentially be an upstander in those types of scenarios. Um, and then I will just say that this also this particular activity um, comes with a student facing video and just, you know, one thing that we've noticed is really powerful is just when you're talking about some of these issues, it can be hard for students to really open up and share and be honest mm -hmm. um, in classroom settings or with adults and what we've just found a lot of success in is being able to take the perspectives of other students being able to share um have something to relate to and then like that kind of is an easy way for them to open up and start the discussion and so really found a lot of power in student facing videos that are like sharing student perspectives thank you isha now moving on to to, to high school you know this is um a stage in life when students are grappling with the pressure to make more adult like decisions uh, while having to navigate their place in, in the world uh, and beyond their immediate group of friends. Now, technology at this time can be an incredibly positive influence in their life, but it also um, can bring its own set of unique challenges. Uh, some of these might include, you know, like identifying how technology makes them feel in, or how they could use technology in a way that makes them feel healthy. Um, being responsible for the digital footprint on social media. So some of you in the challenges talked about uh, that lack of social awareness about your digital footprint, you, you know, and how that might impact you later on. So that's definitely a big issue that we'll see, especially in high school as students are thinking about applying to colleges. Um, and then another one really is responding to, to social justice issues like the pre that like the presence of online hate speech. So, so as we as, as you saw in the research, we know online hate speech uh, is a rising issue. And it is important to to help our students not only navigate the, 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 that, that toxic environment, but also for those of you for, for those who might not be part of marginalized communities to learn how they can be upstanders uh, as Isha was mentioning. Uh, in the context of, of middle school. So one of the way and kind of like building on, on this idea of, of the importance of scenario based activities, one of the ways we, we address this issue in high school is also through, through, through a scenario. And this particular scenario that, that you see here is all about responsible decision making. And this is really about self awareness, too. you know, it's, it's about uh, putting students in a situation where their actions, the actions that they do with technology and the digital footprint that those leave can impact not just them, but then the people around them. And so we have this example where um, students engage in non-ideal behavior. Um, and then we really have like help them walk through like the different impacts that that behavior can have, not just on them, but, but, but on the people around them. And so that this is just another example of you know, how you could leverage this sort of like scenario based approach, the dispositional approach to get your students to, to really build those um, digital citizenship and social emotional learning skills. 
Awesome. Um, in an interest of time, I realize that we're we're cutting it to the end. I'm going to skip us doing this Mentimeter. If you have already, though, that's great. But the idea here is that I want us to get to kind of what are some key takeaways that you can take and kind of get going with you tomorrow or whether it's next week or next month. So just thinking about those issues that you had shared or challenges earlier on um, that your young people and students are facing, if you can kind of think about, and you know, now and as you kind of leave this webinar, what are, where do you feel like you would focus from a kind of castle competency area? Where do you feel like your students need to potentially have more that, that the starting point of focus if you're trying to address these? And so if it's media balance, what would that look like? If it's the, you know, cyberbullying, there's like a lot of digital drama going on in our, you know, class culture, this is where I'll focus. So just, I want you to think through that as we kind of are nearing the end here um, and also just share that we put together um, a, what we call an SEL and digital life resource center. And so taking into account that, you know, we, we acknowledge that SEL is a core component of digital citizenship. What we wanted to do was make those ex kind of connections more explicit and make them deeper. And so we mm -hmm. have this suite of 20 quick activities. The idea is that they're 15 minute activities. They are aligned to CASEL's framework. Um, there is one activity per competency. And so there's five per grade band, um, one for each competency. And the idea is that these are quick activities that you can grab and go and use during an advisory period or homeroom or 15 minutes before you, you know, start the rest of your lesson. They come with the accompanying conversation starters in Spanish and English that Daniel had shared earlier. Um, also coming with uh, teacher's essential guide to SEL. So just really like what is the 101 on social emotional learning and digital citizenship and how they're related. Um, and then additional professional learning resources. We also have um, these exciting new social emotional learning um, film based lesson plans. And so picked certain movies that we think are have a really great SEL focus. Um, and they kind of come with this active viewing guide for students where it focuses on specific clips and the social emotional learning connections that there are um, and a full lesson plan for educators. And so all of those resources are available at this link and we'll be sharing out all these links after as well. Um, and it comes also with a very a full scope and sequence that we put around the skills and dispositions. And so this chart is another one that we'll share of just at every grade band, what's happening, what are the learning objectives and the skill progression that's taking place. <laughs> um, and then Daniel, if you could share about Digital Citizenship Week coming up. Yeah, and I just wanted to share like, so this is a really cool opportunity. So every year, the third week, week of October, we celebrate uh, Digital Citizenship Week. Uh, and this year, the theme of the week is social and emotional well-being. And we're very excited for, for, for Digital Citizenship Week uh, this year, especially because it really, we're thinking about it really as a way to help uh, bring up educators that maybe don't feel comfortable talking about tech or digital citizenship with students to the table. And so uh, we're doing that through the lens of SEL. And so this is a great way for, if you're interested in teaching uh, digital citizenship, uh, this is a great way for you to become engaged. Uh, and so we, 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 we shared the link, uh, I think on, on the chat for, for, for Digital Citizenship Week uh, landing page, and there you'll find all the resources that you need to get started with SEL in Digital Life, as well as a suite of activities that you could do throughout the week. Uh, to make this not just something that you do in your own individual classroom, but you, that you could do as a whole community, uh, as a whole school community. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and before we open it up for questions, uh, I just wanted to highlight one additional kind of exciting opportunity, and it, it probably won't apply to everyone here, um, but the we do have a evaluation, we're evaluating the curriculum and we have an opportunity to participate in a, in a study that we're doing in partnership with the RAND Corporation uh, to be able to implement the six lessons 
within sixth grade. So we're specifically talking about sixth grades um, in schools where there have not been any prior initiatives around digital citizenship or the like. And so if that's something of interest and you would be interested in participating and kind of kickstarting the initiative around digital citizenship within your school, um, there will be a link here that we'll share for you to just kind of learn more about what we're talking about. There's a lot of details to understand. And then at the end of that link, there's just a Google form to just share like, hey, I'm interested, fill out a little bit of stuff, and then we'll get in touch um, if we feel like the there's a match. And so we're just, again, wanting to make sure that it would be a school in which everyone's on board to teach like all sixth graders six lessons that would start sometime between January or February of next year. Um, and so if that's an opportunity you're excited about, uh, feel free to check that link out. And then I will open it up for questions. Right. Thank you so much, um, Daniel and Isha, for that presentation. I see so much excitement in the chat over these resources and this information. Uh, so I'm hoping this will be really useful. Um, I'm going to start with a question that we got that was submitted earlier from one of our participants around um, how do you support teachers in really getting comfortable and knowledgeable about SEL and digital citizenship so that they can do these types of learning experiences and lessons? So I, I, I could start <laughs> with uh, trying to answer that question and Ishi could support me uh, if I miss anything. But um, as Isha mentioned, one of we, we have professional development resources for educators, which are totally free. So one way we support educators is by giving them access to that professional learning that is so essential for implementing things like digital citizenship and, and social and emotional learning. Now, to that little piece about comfort, something that um, I think we really try to highlight in this presentation and that we really always try to emphasize in our professional development is how interconnected digital citizenship and social emotional learning are to all the different content areas that teachers are teaching. And so that is something that, you know, we, we really try to hone in, you know, no matter what subject you teach, you can teach digital citizenship and you could teach uh, social emotional learning. Just to give you an example, like, an issue that kind of like that I that is kind of present in my mind is is around creativity and about fairness. And I don't know if you're aware, but a few months ago there was some some debate about um, black creators on TikTok not getting enough credit for creating dances, right? So if you are an art teacher, right, this is a great opportunity for you to talk about things like what does it mean to to credit someone for the work for the creative work that they do? And so you know this is something this is an issue that is relatable to, to young people um, that is also connected to, to digital citizenship. You know, we have a, a lesson that talks about, you know, um, attributing work to other people, like being not just like a, a, a ethical consumer of media, but also being an ethical producer and distributor of media. And so we really try to hone in on, on those curricular connections that it should have with, with everything else. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, I think you're highlighting um, so, so many important themes here. One that we talk about all the time at Castle around adult SEL being part of this work and adults understanding for themselves how to do this. Um, and also sort of the interconnectedness and the threads to so many other subjects that this could elevate. Um, and I'm wondering, um, you know, the other one of the other questions we had heard about was what are the connections when you think about digital citizenship to non digital citizenship like is, is it the same thing now that we're living in a very digital world, or are there differences there that are important to enunciate. I think, I think it's a good question I think we should be like part of me never wants to think of this as its own separate world, right? I mean, if we think about the way in which we're interacting, technology just happens to be the medium by which that's happening, but it's a part of our normal life and it's not something distinct. I think that's where we really, we don't see digital citizenship as its own distinct kind of subject area off in a silo, but that we really think for it to be effective and to really acknowledge and support young people in, you know, in life, not just digital life, we need to be able to kind of acknowledge the way in which it's being used in every realm. And so that means whatever subject you're teaching, the, the school culture has to be one that promotes it. And the idea is that we're also promoting that at home. But I think, I think it's a good point to just say that it, it is all blended to some degree mm -hmm. 
and it is a new normal. Like there's no like going back and it's, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, let's acknowledge the reality and make the most of it in productive ways. Right. Thanks, Isha. Um, and I, I know we have just a couple minutes left. And I'm wondering if maybe each of you can just sum up very quickly. What do you think is the one key takeaway as folks are walking out of here, going into their classrooms or their schools or their community context? Um, what's, a, what's a takeaway that folks should walk out of here with? I think for me, the takeaway is it's it's really important for us, especially at this moment in time, to to focus on the social emotional well being of our young people, and and that kind of goes to whatever your role is an as an educator. Like we should be taking that on as our kind of priority in order to help promote academic success, and in doing that, let's take the initiative to understand what the toll has been in their world from a tech standpoint, and integrate that into the way in which we address SEL. And just to, to build on that uh, on that point, um, I would really like to just highlight um, the equity implications for digital citizenship, right? We live at a time that is filled with opportunity and really something that digital citizenship um, tries to get at is including people so that they could participate in an increasingly digital society. And so keeping in mind, you know, like how uh, increasing access uh, to devices and media and technology to communities that didn't have it really needs to be met with those like this approach to the digital citizenship you know so we equip them with those skills and, and, and just so that we're all sort of like in in in, in a space we could where we could all contribute positively to to a world um, to the world around us well, thank you again so much, Daniel and Isha. I think those are great yeah. takeaways for us to um, walk out of here with. And in the last minute here, I'm going to turn it back over to Emily to close us out. Thanks so much. Thank you.